Some of you know me as the founder of Mixergy, where I interview entrepreneurs about how they built their businesses. I write every single day, and he found stuff from like six, seven years ago. I love because this. here's what it is. Anyone can write today and maybe be right today, or, or who knows, to look back and see. Pump music for this. This is great. Hey, I'm Andrew. Um, I got to tell you a quick story. Some of you know me as the founder of Mixergy, where I interview entrepreneurs about how they built their businesses. A few years ago, I had on these entrepreneurs like the founders of Airbnb. They were listeners. They wanted to be on. The founder of Twitch uh, sold his company for about a billion dollars to Amazon, comes on to talk about how he did it, all this stuff. And I remember sending out email to my audience saying, look at these guys. Come see it. They came, but not that many. And I looked at the open rates on the email, and they were just, eh. I looked at the click rates, and just, eh. And um, I thought, there's something wrong with me. I'm not doing something right. And then this guy whose company I invested in said, look at this. And he shows me MailChimp's open and click rates, and I realized, oh, email's kind of painful in general. It's not just me. What do I do? And then I looked at the way that I was interacting with my wife, with my coworkers. I wasn't sending email to them. My wife and I are texting each other all day. If you're in a relationship with someone right now, either because you love them or because you're working with them, are you using email or chat to communicate with them? Just say it out loud if it's, you know what, actually? Yeah, let's say it out loud. Email or chat to communicate with the people you love? Chat, chat right? A lot of chat. You guys are pivoting to chat, or you're adding chat, aren't you? Yeah, Help Scout is adding chat. Start out as an email system. So I said, what do I do? And then there was this guy. Russian guy, Mikhail Yang. He's like coming to San Francisco, flitting from San Francisco to Russia to God knows where, and he sees the same problem, only nobody believes in him because he's talking chat bots, and people are like, bot, what the f bot? And then this one guy said, you know, I like you, you're ambitious, you're determined, I see you're building something over here, Let's take a shot on you. And that guy was actually Marvin. And he invested a little bit of money, right? It wasn't, how much money was it? 150. 150,000, which for San Francisco is lunch money. But it was enough to get him going. And this guy, Mike, suddenly started to hire people in Russia. I don't think he had a single employee in the US after he raised, right? Because 150 is not enough to, to pay anything. As an aside, my kids are now going to, to kindergarten in San Francisco. If you make less than $300,000 in San Francisco, you actually qualify for financial aid. They feel sorry for you. I swear to God, that's a true story. True, right? The Quaker School. Three, true story. Yeah, he lives there. So the point I'm making is this guy who's traveling the world, who had this idea, who's not from the U.S., gets funding, and suddenly his idea gets superpowered, right? So we think a lot as people who are remote workers, I can go it alone. I don't need the infrastructure, right? But sometimes if you get the right person to believe in you, the right funding to get going, this idea that would have been okay. Mike was never gonna die, right? Never. He's They're crushing it. Yeah, he's a cockroach. He was never gonna die. But because of your funding, because of what you said, and I'll bring up some of what you said, I hope, he was able to grow. And my goal here today is to understand how more cockroaches, more, let's say, nomads, more travelers, more people with big ideas can raise money from these guys and other investors to continue to grow even if it means that they don't want to stay in one place. And God knows I still don't know where Mike is. All right, so these guys are here to do that. Let's give them a big round of applause for doing it here. All right, let's be open though. Where do you live? Uh, I live in the world's most expensive third world city, San Francisco. Right, so are we really gonna believe that you value San Francisco enough to go live there and you're gonna be okay with people living wherever they want? Yeah, I also spend 50% of my time traveling as well too, right? Okay. So um, I came to this journey of, of remote work, even when I was exec at Yahoo, my last couple business groups were actually fully remote. And so I ran a business group that was stretched between Dubai, India, like five, six cities in Europe, and I was based in San Francisco. And so I had to manage remotely, and we didn't have all the tools that actually are available now, right? We didn't have Slack, we used um, Yahoo Messenger, which is a piece of crap and totally dead now. And, um, and sort of in email, right? And lots of, and very, I spent, I was the number one, I think I was the number three biggest phone bill every month at Yahoo. Because Yours, was, because yeah, you were traveling yeah, yeah, so much and paying international yeah, rates. Talked, so that was the way we managed. We didn't have things like Zoom. Okay. We didn't have things like Slack, 
Um, and so it's a completely different beast now. Can I call you Pomp? I always want a nickname like that. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to call me something else, so go ahead. Really? All right. So have you invested, Pomp, in anyone who does have a remote team? Yeah, I think that, so when I think of remote, it's a spectrum, right? We were talking last night, there's like fully centralized and uh -huh. fully distributed teams. I think we've probably invested in teams that are all along that spectrum, everything from no office. I mean, we're literally right now investing in a company that doesn't even have a fiat bank account in the crypto world, um, all the way to teams where 50, 60% of the team's in one central location and the rest is distributed. And you mentioned crypto, that has been your focus. It has been for the last two years. So far, so good. I actually read that you said that Bitcoin's going to go down and then it's going to go back up. And sure enough, it went down and up. Did you invest in it, in that down? Uh, we are big investors in Bitcoin. And uh, it, look, Bitcoin's a perfect example of like, if you ask me what's the ultimate example of quote unquote remote work, right? You're looking at a company, an organization, a network that's built by a group of volunteers on the internet uh, that have no hierarchical authority. There's no paycheck for these people, et cetera. It's all people who kind of collectively have organized around something that they believe in. It's working. You know, we'll, we'll see kind of what happens. But I think there's a lot of similarities between the development of a decentralized, you know, network like that and, uh, and remote work. Uh, you're saying cryptocurrencies are decentralized. We all here are decentralized. It seemed crazy that crypto was going to do well. It seems maybe not so crazy here, but same possibility. For sure. What do, you, what do you like to see in a company that is working remote? Do you see anything different that you'd want to see in them? You go first. I have, I have lots of thoughts on that. I, I think that I like, to, I like to make sure the founding team actually knows each other very, very well and actually done this, like not done the remote work before, but actually have just strong ties, like long-time friendship. I like that in any, whether it's remote or, or not remote, but it's actually really, really important to see that they have a very cohesive culture and they're thoughtful also about the culture. Okay, and so you wanna see that the culture is thoughtful and that they're caring. How do you make sure that they're doing that? How can you tell? Um, I ask some questions about like, you know, meetings, how you run meetings. Um, I ask them about like where their teams are, how they're thinking about like, like and especially in SF now, right? Which is, I think that you're gonna see a lot of, and I was talking to someone about this earlier, I think you're gonna see a huge wave of change where I think VCs, most traditional VCs do not like remote companies and remote, you know, sort of remote in general. But I think I've seen a wave of change, even distributed companies where five years ago, um, when VCs would be like, I'm gonna give you money, you gotta move, you gotta move to San Francisco and that's it. Uh -huh. And that's changed, right? Because of just how ridiculously expensive SF is now. And so a lot of folks have actually discovered religion of just at least distributed companies. So keep all your engineering team wherever you are, Canada, Russia, wherever, right? Like Ukraine, Latin America, and you keep your sales team somewhere in the US. And that's totally acceptable now. Five years ago was not. And I actually think that if you look at a lot of the next generation VCs are going, why are you not thinking remote? So I know initialized cap capital, they're totally thinking about this. You're saying now people are, investors are asking, why aren't you thinking remote if yeah, you want my money? You're, you're stupid if you're trying to hire, a, build a total engineering team in San Francisco where they're totally mercenary, it's super expensive, and it just, it makes no sense. There's two pieces to this too. So one is when I first started investing full time, um, we actually ran a distributed team by accident, right? Uh, we weren't in Silicon Valley or New York. I live in New York now, but at the time we weren't. And out of our first fund, we invested in 62 companies and about 50% of them I never met in person, right? And it was all phone calls, video, et cetera. And so it wasn't a big deal because we were essentially doing the same thing. So it's kind of if you've done it, you're, you're familiar with it. But the other piece of it um, is I, I recently uh, invested in a friend's company and uh, I was catching up with him the other day and he says, listen, we do a great job of um, sourcing potential candidates on the engineering side. Uh, we do a great job of getting them excited about what we're doing. We've gone one for five on our last f uh, five offers. And I was like, well, that's not good, right? Where are the other four, where'd they go? And one, the mercenary type approach of Google, Facebook, you know, whoever comes in over the top with just more money. Or two was what they realized somebody offered them an opportunity to work from anywhere in the world, and so they were actually gonna leave San Francisco and take the job with somebody based in San Francisco. And okay. so I think what you're seeing is this remote work stuff is going to become an advantage for companies that embrace it versus the companies that, you know, you have to be here. What about this? I went back, I told you before we started, I looked at your old blog posts, right? Internet Archive rocks. He found a blog post that I don't even knew existed anymore. <laughs> 
Oh, a bunch. Like there was one where he was saying, Snapchat is kind of interesting. One day it's going to potentially be something or it's gonna go down. Here's why I think it's gonna be something. Not only was it something, you ended up working for them, right? That's right. About a year or so after that blog post. The top of your site has the Kool-Aid man busting through a wall. This is a long time ago. But at the top it says in graffiti, thou shall hustle hard. Actually, thou shall hustle harder. If somebody doesn't want to live in San Francisco or doesn't want to live in a major city and work hard enough to earn that money, are they hustling hard enough? Like if the employee, if a, if a company is not willing to do it? So like for me, uh, I'm really big on uh, self-ownership, right? So um, I think that how the conference started with the video of there's a gentleman who's from a country that most of us probably don't understand growing up in that type of environment. He's got physical disabilities, right? But yeah. he says, look, I'm going to teach myself some, a skill. I'm going to acquire the tools I need, and then I'm going to go make a living. What I tend to find, especially in San Francisco and uh, New York on the finance side, is people walk around and they're like, you know, why am I not getting paid two, three hundred thousand dollars a year and get a free lunch and you know while I type on my computer someone massages my foot. Right? I mean it's crazy. And no, so I hear people complain, why are we doing sushi again? Like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Like that's your complaint for work. Yeah, and, and well, and what I think you find is uh, people who are drawn to remote work, what they're actually optimizing for is they're optimizing for life and being happy and enjoying something else other than work. Um, and the work is they make the work work. Those are better creators, better entrepreneurs. More Marvin, creative. do you agree with that? Somebody who's optimizing for happiness is going to build a better company? No, he doesn't agree with it. Yeah, I, I would say it, it depends, right? And so one of the things, like one of the, the, the things I specifically look for in founders, I actually look for immigrant kids. They just, they have had deprivation in general and they know how to work hard, they're hungry. Okay. And, and if you have that, you can work from anywhere. You just don't care that, at that point. Yeah. Help Scout, you guys are doing well, right? How long into the company, the founder of Help Scout is here, I love the software. How long into the company do you guys try to raise money? Four years. Four years into the company, you tried to raise money never before? And were investors open to you guys wait, being more of a distributed team? So you had to wait till you were doing well enough financially for them to take you seriously. Did anyone not take you seriously before? No, they didn't, right? Partially you think because it was a dist distributed team? Yeah, they just couldn't pattern match us with somebody else. Pattern match, yeah. And so what I, think that, I think that's really changed though, right? Now there is the pattern of there's been multiple teams that have been successful. So uh, the people who kind of, the first people through the door always suffer. Now that there's a, a string of success, now people are like, oh, this can work. Got it. Um, but, but it just takes time, right? So four years is probably, you know, you get anywhere kind of two to eight year type there, time. There, there's so many, we, we, we can listen. There's so many examples. Like I said, I'm not going to use automatic, but like there's Envision, <laughs> there's Zapier, there's TopTel, there's GitLab. These are huge companies, right? GitLab is worth several billion. We're investors in them. You know, like Envision, they have 950 people totally remote. And they're worth probably three or four billion as well, too. Like and so. you're saying, look, all these people have done it as remote teams. Yeah. It's been proven. Yeah. You're not the it crazy is now, guy now. And I think that's really what uh, TopTel is another company. I think it's almost 120 people. And Andreessen Horowitz is putting like 40 or 50 million into them because it just works. Uh -huh. uh, the, the, best, yeah. the best example I've seen, uh, which I think stresses the complexity of doing this. So there, in the crypto world, there's a company called Binance. It's the largest exchange in, in uh, crypto. And in 18 months, they went from a 30-person team that was working on something else. They pivoted, created this exchange. They went from 30 people to 400 in over 40 different countries. And so when you talk to the CEO, he last year in Q1 did $500 million in revenue. Right. So imagine in less than two years going from basically nothing to five hundred million dollars in revenue in a quarter and you have four hundred employees in forty two countries. Now it's crypto, so there's all these complexities with that. But if you ask them what the biggest problem with that is, it's not hiring, it's not it's communication. Right? He said, look, multiple times along the way, and I think Andreas hit on it this morning, they've had to revamp how they communicate internally because Telegram groups don't work anymore. Then it was Slack. Then Slack doesn't even work anymore. And so they've had to continue to iterate that. Oh, because it the way be that they're communicating isn't working. All those old tools aren't working anymore. Well, just imagine if you've got a company with 100 people and two weeks later, now it's 170. What, those 70 people are like, uh, <laughs> what do I do? Right? So, I mean, that's like, a that's like the extreme example of hyper growth, fully distributed, 400 people in less than a year and a half. There's a lot of challenges there. 
I think the beauty is a lot of teams, what we see in the remote work side is they're taking their time and they're really hiring the right people, right? And, and you've got to almost focus more on like the fundamentals of building a business okay. because you don't get the benefit of sitting next to somebody, right? You have to be very intentional about the way that you spend your time. Let's talk about some of that. By the way, the people who are starting new, who are like, well, uh, what do I do? Trainual is one of the sponsors of this conference, I think, right? And Trainual will let you create a manual for new people to show Super them what's cool going on. Product, right? You know it. Yeah. Super cool product. I mean, one of the things why I've, I've watched, you know, I, I've been tracking like the digital nomad, which is this before it became cool and became sort of like Instagram douchebaggery, right? But like, why, why it's actually interesting I to watch they, it. I bet why, they, why, didn't yeah. think, they didn't think you were going to say that on <laughs> Yeah, but it, it's actually interesting to watch it because a lot of the tools they're using actually become mainstream. Yeah, let's so talk about some of the tools. The, they're almost on the cutting edge, right? So they were early users of like Slack before I think a lot of people used it. Um, and so there, there's a lot of tool sets I watch very closely. I'm just like, oh, I should keep an eye on this one to sort of see, like, especially SaaS tools. Could you give me some, Marvin? What are you seeing, right? You're, you're not just watching companies. You're paying attention to see who sure. you should invest in. So you see what's working for them as distributed teams. What are you seeing? What software? What techniques? So, like, VPN software. I've been watching that for a while. That's really interesting. VPN. Yeah, VPN. Ah, um, right. Or, thing, or things like password holders, right? Like yeah. Like password and other ones. Like because if you're in the same office, you can just go and ask your boss to log you in. You don't need a password there's manager, but so when many, you're working yeah, remote. There's just so many use cases for these different tools. And I think that, that this remote work environment actually allows for innovation of just like there's specific tools are built for them and that will eventually become mainstream. Do you have others? So you, VPN, password managers, VPN to allow you to connect to the internet securely and not have somebody watch what you're doing. What else? Um, we were investors in Merle. Um, you know, if that presented earlier as well too. I mean, that totally makes sense, right? Um, Envision was a product I used, and I'm just like, why did I not invest in this company? This is such an amazing product. For design? Yeah, for design. Okay. What, one framework that yeah. I think has become popular for venture investors, and this is important for entrepreneurs to understand how investors evaluate opportunities, is look at existing products and how they're being hacked Right, so Craigslist is the perfect example where, okay, what's the activity happening on Craigslist? And then Airbnb went and took the housing and created a whole business around it, right? And kind of sliced okay. off pieces of Craigslist. But when it comes to remote work, one of the interesting tools that I see people hacking is Google Docs, right? So I was talking to some people earlier and said, that there's a company that I know, and what they do is they have these asynchronous meetings. Yeah. So they've got people around the world and they can't all find one time to meet. So what they do is every day they have a Google document and basically the first person up in Asia, right, they get up and they start putting in the notes or the comments for the day. And it kind of is a wave across the world. So then you get Europe online, East Coast, West Coast, and North America, et cetera. And so, that one day, I'm sure somebody's going to build a product to have asynchronous meetings around, right? And so if you look at a tool like Google Docs, people are trying to hack the functionality to work that when that gets spun out into a company, like that's a perfect example of where investors get excited because they know there's very little market risk here because we know people want this tool. They're already using something else that isn't built to do that to do it. I would love to find a team that you know actually wants to go focus on. So we should pay attention. What are we doing? What software are we using that's not exactly working right, but we're forcing it? And that could be the next product that we create. If we ask people in here, name the products that you use on a daily basis and like tell us how you're using them for not what they're supposed to be used right, for, right, yeah. everyone has something, right? And so yeah. I think that's like a very interesting way to look at the remote work because what you find is the companies are slow followers to the trend, right? So, you, so Marvin's probably saying, I mean, I don't know, when's the first time you ever saw a remote team? Years ago, right? And so now we're seeing companies over the last two, three years start building software for these teams. Um, and so I think that the, the future wave of those software companies are the way that we're hacking products today. So I know we've been talking to people who are thinking of raising money so far, but I know that there, was, there are few people out there who said, I'm not sure that I'm ready for this yet. Like, I'm not ready for venture capital. Like, uh, Alex Holland and I were talking about how he's a one-man operation. He's working with a bunch of freelancers. He wants to go much bigger. He can see himself get to... Alex, are you here? There he is, right there, right? Alex has is, is got a vision of one day getting to 100 freelancers or 100 people working for him and building this business. What do you recommend for someone who thinks, I want to go bigger? How can they think about it? How can they get exposed to ideas that will let them go bigger? My big thing around, well, I think what you're asking is basically, should you raise money or should you not? And the way that I always think about this is founders almost always do better personally if they don't raise capital. And the only reason to raise capital is because you can't do what you want without the money. 
right, is kind of the framework. So, um, you know, if you look at somebody like uh, Aaron Levy at Box, like he, he's just an egregious example. He raised hundreds of millions, maybe even a couple billion dollars to take Box public. When it went public, he owned 4% of the company. Like the founder of Box, a multi-billion dollar company, owned 4% when it went public. Now that was worth $80 million, right? So on, on a dollar value, it was worth a lot, but 4% of the business that he built. That's the way that when you have to scale really fast and raise a lot of money, you've got competitors, all this stuff, you know, that, that's kind of the egregious example. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I have, I think that VCs, VC money is, is, you have to be super thoughtful if you are going to take VC money versus angel money is also very, very different, right? But I'm talking as VC institutional money, what we represent. You like, you raise VC money when you want to scale like crazy. So it's a stage that you're actually in where the product's at a certain level. Maybe you're somewhat close to product to market fit. That's when you actually raise VC money. But I, I, one example I use is Atlassian. I'm a huge fan of Atlassian in general. And so we had Scott, who was one of the co-founders of Atlassian, you know, show up and he did a talk for us um, in one of my programs. And, he, you, know, you know, when they went public, him and his co-founder each owned 30% of the company. That company's worth $7 billion, right? And they did not raise anything. They sold a bunch of secondaries to Excel, but outside of that, like they didn't raise any VC money because they want to grow at their pace. And so I think raising money is, a, is based on personal preference. It's sort of what type of business are you and then whether you want to do it because I, I would argue that you want to be super, super thoughtful when you raise institutional money because it's like, but the only thing is that you're getting married and it's different is you're getting married and you can't get divorced. Um, and so you have to be super thoughtful about this. What I mean though is you're working with people who think much bigger, right? Box didn't think, all right, we'll create this cute little thing for people who have small files that they want to pass to their friends. We'll make it free and maybe we'll make a dollar per person eventually. No, they were thinking bigger, enterprise, big sales, right? Same thing with uh, Atlassian. Help people who are starting out here, and that's why they came, to think bigger. What would you recommend that they do? There's a saying uh, in the U.S. Army that says basically uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast, right? And the whole idea is basically you have to kind of crawl before you walk, before you run. And I think in building companies, that's actually the key. Like one of my favorite things to remind founders of over and over and over again to the point where it just like sear this in your brain is find the 100 people that will literally like beat down the door if you take the product away from them. Okay. Don't worry about thousands of users, millions of users. Like build a product that those 100 or those 10 people just absolutely love and then go find more of those people, right? And, and I think that the problem with building companies today or the challenge is that we've celebritized the founder who raises hundreds of millions of dollars and has this huge company but for every one of those people, there's a thousand or hundreds of others that have gone out, tried to raise money and haven't been able to. Okay. And instead what we should be celebritizing is the people who built a product that there was those hundred people who just wanted to beat down the door. Right? Slack's a perfect example. Everyone in here probably uses Slack or knows what it is. It started out as a gaming company, right? And it wasn't working. And all of a sudden they're like, well, what, is people, what are people using? Wait, we want more than a hundred customers. Many of us. You can't get to 1,000 without the first 100. So you say, get to the first 100, make sure they're diehard. Did you, you were an entrepreneur before. Did you get to that? Talk, talk about what happened with your business. Yeah, look, the, li literally, uh, the very first company I ever had, we built a advertising network for public school districts. So in the US, um, there's uh, a bunch of um, public schools that have a website or a portal. So you go put a username and password in, and parents can check the homework, they can check their kids' grades, assignments, all this kind of stuff. And all over the internet are display ads. But on these portals into public schools, admin controls, there's no advertising. And so school districts were starving for money. And these are some of the most trafficked websites in the entire country, right? There's millions of hits on these per month. And so we went to school districts and we said, look, can we just put a link to an online business directory of local businesses for your school district? We'll charge them. We'll go do all the sales. We'll take a portion. We'll give you a portion. Uh, all you have to do is put the link there. Obviously, it's free money. They love it. Uh, and my co-founders and I went around, like I was telling my girlfriend the other day, we used to drive to the shopping center and like walk into random stores and be like, hey, is the owner here? I didn't know what we were, like today, no one would do that, right? You'd go and you'd run ads or you'd like do all this stuff to try to build businesses. But all we knew was, well, we had to go get the first one, right? So let's go find that. The first local like, business, the local yeah, pizzeria, the local. 30 bucks. That's okay, it. 30 bucks. Barbershop. And that's what you'd person. sell. 
And did you find the schools, 100 schools who loved you that passionately? The schools were the easiest part because we're giving them a free check. Uh, it was the local right. businesses. The local businesses, because the business, you know, look, if you're the local pizza parlor, right, you're trying to figure out who's showing up tonight for shifts. You're not worried about, you know, what advertisement you're putting on the right. internet, right? How big did you get it in revenue? Um, so we never disclosed the revenue number. Uh, Let's do it, it now. It, uh, it went pretty well. Um, Give us a sense of scope, over five million in revenue? Do it. A sense of scope, just a scope, over five million? Uh, we built it and sold it in 18 months and the run rate was pretty close to that. Wow, how much did you sell it for? Uh, I've never disclosed that either. It was bought by a company called Finder411, which was the uh, fast follower to um, like Groupon, Living Social, okay. all those guys. Uh, another key is uh, sell the business when somebody thinks it's worth more than you think it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> I heard 25 million, is that crazy? Uh, no, it wasn't that much. It wasn't that much, okay. And then you got into crypto. He's right? going to keep asking me until I tell him. I, I mean, but I'm not going to tell him. Yeah, but, but to answer your question about like, what, is, saving. What, what is actionable for, for the, the folks, yeah. this is, this is in, in line with advice of just like, before you raise money, focus on who the fanatical customer are, focus on getting one customer, then add a zero, focus on getting 10, after you get to 10, focus on getting 100, then 1,000. And then once you sort of feel comfortable what the customer segment is and you feel like that could lead to a much bigger market, that might be the time you talk to a VC. We're being way too nice here. Um, <laughs> so I talked to Mike Yang. I invested in his company. I did really well with that, right? Great company, ManyChat. I said, look, tell me a little bit about Marvin's personality. What was he like? He says, yeah, he's supportive. I said, tell me more. He goes, he liked to practice tough love. I mean, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, we have to keep presenting to Marvin so we could practice, get feedback from him, and eventually present to people who are going to invest in us. I go, yeah. He goes, he would always tell us we're never going to raise money. He would tell everyone they're never going to raise money. You're smiling awkwardly. Is this, is this inappropriate for me to bring up? Yeah, totally, totally appropriate. Right? You're hard. So let's be hard here, too. Let's treat people here with the same kind of love. What is going to be the big challenge to raising money that they're not going to figure out until they go out there? Be open. Um, yeah, so, so I actually think that you want to understand the type of business that you're in. There are only certain types of businesses that are venture fundable, all right? So for example, like if you're an e-commerce business, no fucking way will you raise money. E-commerce, yeah. no way. Yeah, no way. Because? Um, if, it's just like, it's just not a venture scalable model. There's so much competition. Okay. Um, versus say, for example, if you're a marketplace business, maybe a differentiated marketplace okay. business because you have network effects. And so I'll give you an example of like, eBay or Craigslist were just like garbage products, right? But boy, they make a lot of money because you, as you have more buyers, okay. you have more sellers, you have more sellers, you have more buyers. So massive network effects, no way can dislodge them. E-commerce, no way. Marketplace, yes. What about people who have freelancers who want to eventually have a lot more contractors or employees under them? Is that scalable? Probably not for you. Probably not. And Or agency business, if you're a service business, no way. You, will, you will not raise VC money. Unless they become more of a marketplace. You mentioned TopTal, right? They raise money because it's more, that's, right. what, that's right. what they should be thinking. How do I not manage these people, but create a marketplace that manages them? Correct. Give me more. I see Pomp is reaching for the mic. What else can we do? I, I think the big thing that he just hit on, so when you go to raise money and somebody tells you no, it's not you, it is the framework, right? And so if you just heard him describe like, there are certain business types that investors have just, whether they're correct or not, have just written as to these are not venture scalable for X, Y, Z reason. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth in these frameworks, right? And so when you go to build a business, you know, you could literally pick any industry in the world and say, hey, I, I'm interested in X, I'd like to build a business there. There are very proven models as to how to build that business and how to scale it. And the part that uh, I think entrepreneurs probably struggle with the most when they're building these models is yeah. like, you wanna build a business that's not dependent on you, which is really hard for most entrepreneurs, right? Because they're usually type A personalities, they want to be involved in everything, but really what you want to do is you want to build a business that if you walked away tomorrow, it still works, right? Okay. And, and I think investors understand that um, if you're a service business, for example, like they want to talk, you know, if you're an ad agency, everyone wants to talk to the most creative person there, who's usually the founder, right? So that makes it really hard to serve tons of customers. If you build that into a marketplace, you're doing the same thing, you're providing ad, um, creative, or ad creatives, but now what you've done is you've taken that founder out of being the most dependent linchpin there, and now it's just people in a marketplace that's much more scalable, and you're lo loosening the dependency on the founder. And so I think I just see a lot of founders who say like, I'm the founder, I really need to you know, be in charge of everything and, and be in control. And actually what you find is the best teams are really, really good about removing the dependency on the founder and almost kind of like building a company that, that gets rid of that founder. Rustam from Distant Job is here. I asked him, why are you here? He goes, I'm snorkeling for a month. 
Go snorkel. Who goes snorkeling for a month? He's got to come. Because I want to stress test the team and make sure. Oh, it's not snorkeling. Sorry, scuba diving. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. That's an insult. <laughs> scuba diving. Excuse me. Uh, okay, so that helps, too. From now on, I'm going to say he snorkeled. The, I like the... What, one, give, me, give me more frameworks, if you could. Yeah, well, I was going to say one other thing. Yeah. Um, and, and Marvin hit on this earlier. So like, when you raise capital, what you're essentially trying to do is you're trying to step on the gas pedal, right? And I think a lot of founders... Um, again, it goes back to what have we celebritized or, or made sexy is this idea of like how much money have you raised as if that's like a proxy for success. Um, actually, the best founders wait as long as possible to raise capital because one, the longer they wait, the more valuable the company will be, which means they'll dilute themselves less. Two, they're more likely to have a bunch of data points that make it a more compelling case to found uh, to investors. So you get the best investors who want to invest. And then three is when they raise that money and they step on the gas, it's not a question of like, are we stepping on the wrong gas pedal, right? You know, if you really, really look at the best companies, what happens is they, they understand that business so much better than companies that don't raise capital. And it's because when they step on the gas, they know if something goes wrong, right? I mean, how many companies have you invested in who they actually start stepping on the gas after they've raised money and they realize, whoa, something's broken. They kind of pull back a little bit, fix it, and then they're able to reaccelerate. Yeah, I mean, tons of companies, right? I mean, I see there's two death points of in, in VC it's the you don't get the product to market fit, so typically see death rates super, super high, right? That's, that's where I play in. Or Series B, after they raise like 30, 40, 50 million, maybe more, sometimes $100 million, and they just spin out of control. Um, and I see that a lot. And why do they spin out of control? Um, because they didn't have a lot of the basics sorted out. Like so, what? Like, for example, like you basics of unit economics, um, hiring the wrong people, right? So, for example, what ends up happening is that this is why VC w actually works, right? Because VC is about metering in money when you hit certain milestones. The problem about the environment that we're in right now, and I go on a tirade on this, is just like there's too much money and there's just too many shit VC investors out there. And the problem is that they're just dumping so much money into these companies. And these founders, like what happens if just like, here, here's the reason why there's like no like super accomplished rich kids in general, right? Like in general, because like they're given everything, so they're uh, soft. Okay. It's the same thing with companies. You give them too much money, they just spend it on stupid crap, right? And they don't spend it on the right things, they don't have the right habits, and then the culture just gets deformed. Everyone spends the money they raise in 18 months. It doesn't matter if you raise $100,000 or $100 million, it's gone in 18 months. Because? That, that's just the way it works, right? It's the law. Because yeah, they it, have it, to? It, 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 it's not because they have to. It's just, it, it's almost like human nature, right? Where like if you're raising capital, you are already planning to raise the next round. And so you know that, hey, we have $100 million. We should go and uh, immediately start spending it to hit these metrics so we can raise the next round. And it becomes, it, it's a drug, right? You become addicted to the venture capital. The, the problem with that is, uh, and we talk to teams all the time, if you raise $3 million or you raise thirty, million, you're going to spend in 18 months, let's not talk about how much you're going to raise. Let's talk about what do you actually need, right, to hit these milestones and kind of back into the numbers. Okay. Um, and if you look at the best teams, you know, um, there's probably four or five examples that we could come up with just up here. They've raised a ton of money, and they don't touch it. Right, so there's huge companies that have, um, I think Slack maybe even uh, yeah, recently. You're sitting on so much cash. I mean, Two, three billion dollars. Michael too, right? Like, Michael doesn't need that money. <laughs> He, and so then why do you raise it? It's just a, it's for backup, I think. And I also think that he's using it to invest in a sales team, but he's still sitting on a lot of that capital. He's not gonna use all of it. So John Uke must be, John, are you here? There he is, he and I were talking. He lives in, is it Ukraine, am I right? Right, loves the Ukraine. But he's thinking of leaving the Ukraine because there aren't a lot of investors there. The ones who are there, right, tell me if I'm wrong, he says, we're thinking too short term, so it's not the kind of people he's thinking of. And so he says, all right, I just might have to leave here to get even a pre-seed. Is that reasonable? Should he just leave? Well, it's probably, you're the best one to make that call, right? In terms of, there's plenty of investors who will invest in companies in the Ukraine, right? There's plenty of entrepreneurs who can build companies in the Ukraine, but can you find that match, right? Is there- Is it easier, route? will he have an easier time leaving and going somewhere else to raise money, even if he comes back to the Ukraine where he explained to me his cost structure is a lot lower because people don't charge as much and they're more committed? It's human nature, right? If, if So is he, he making the right move San to leave? Francisco. Well, let's just say that he moved to San Francisco, yeah. right? There's some subset of the investor base that's going to be more comfortable investing in someone that they can go to the office, they can meet in person, et cetera. Okay. That doesn't make the investors right, and that doesn't mean that he should move, but 
what you're essentially trying to do as a founder, you're trying to find investors who are the right investor for you, right? I mean, okay. it, it, it's just, it's really, really hard for founders to uh, stay, I think, enthusiastic about raising money when they hear no over and over and over again. But it really is trying to find that, that marriage, right? And, and this is particularly hard in, in regions that don't have a lot of investors. So for example, it's, it's not easy to raise money, but it's the, your odds are higher. Because I'll give you an example, like my companies that end up, and like I run an accelerator program, I'm gonna do investments as well too, but like my accelerator companies, like I tell them, like for every $500,000 you wanna raise, you gotta talk to about 100 people. Wait, let's give that number again. People are gonna write this down. For every? For every $500,000 that you want to raise, you got to talk to about 100 people. 100 people, and how do you find those 100 people? Just uh, use your network and you got to hunt. That's it. Yeah, just like, it's super hard. Like, it's okay. really, really hard. Speaking that, of, I- the test, by the way. Can you talk to 100 as part of the test? Well, we'll just, when a founder says, hey, I talked to five people and I can't raise any money, uh, I think there's a light bulb or like an alarm that goes off in an investor's head of like, if you can't find the 100 people to talk to that are qualified, right? So it's not just, hey, yes. go talk to anyone on the street. It's 100 people who are investors, have capital, are interested in the space, whatever. Because it's also a sign for an investor that, well, when you wanna go after customers, how are you gonna get to the decision maker at that company? How are you gonna convince that candidate to leave their job and come you know, work for you, right? And so it's, th there's not necessarily rules to building companies, but there's definitely best practices or frameworks. And, and one of them is, if you are as a founder can't raise capital and it's a function of you can't talk to enough people, it's actually a, a red flag for a lot of venture investors on other aspects of the business that, that you might not even realize they're paying attention to. And, and, and this might sound unfair, but the reality is that we're managing other people's money. And so we have to, and we don't have a lot of interaction with them. So we're trying to figure out the type of person that you are, the type of founder and business person that you are, how much grit you have, how creative you are. And so it's, and it's not fair, but like this is how we have to judge you because we, we judge you from every interaction, the, how you answer questions, how the, the type of, just like everything, right? Like yeah. in, in the very limited time that we have with you. It sounds crazy, but I saw somebody, there was a Twitter thread recently uh, from an investor, I, f I forget who it was, but they basically were like, when you're a founder and you meet an investor, like you're basically under the microscope, right? And so when you send an email and the investor responds and you don't respond for six hours, right? There's some investors who look at that as a negative signal. There's some investors that look at it as a positive signal, some investors who don't care. But every investor looks at every single data point differently. And there is a world where if a founder isn't super responsive, a me you know, there's probably a very large percentage of investors who say, wait a minute, are they not gonna be responsive to employees? Are they not gonna be responsive uh, to customer support or right. customers? Like, oh, I, I, I can't invest in somebody who can't do that, right? How now, long again, does it take you to respond to an email? So I'm, I'm like horrible with it. And uh -huh. part of it is uh, I have a very specific communication channel that I focus all my energy on, which Twitter? is I tell people, if you want to get in touch with me, DM me on Twitter. Literally, you'll respond to somebody DMing you. I, I, my email, I've, I literally probably have 3,000 unread emails. If somebody DMs me on Twitter, I respond to almost, as much as I can, almost every single person. Would somebody try it here? His Twitter handle is POMP, P-O-M-P. Just say hi, <laughs> a, a, nothing a else. What is it? A Pompliano. Oh, it's not, it's not POMP? No, nah, there's a DJ in Houston, Texas oh, who has okay. it. If, he, I, I actually asked him for it so many times, he blocked me. <laughs> So if anybody can get in touch with them, that'd be so great. So A Pompliano, that's P-O-M-P-L-I-N-O. P-O-M, well, it's on your, your card. Um, so one of the reasons why people came here is to get to know other people, right? This they could watch on YouTube. They want to get to know you. Let's, let's talk a little bit about what you guys do outside of work to give people a hook for a conversation. You read a lot, Marvin, right? I read a crap ton. You do? Like what? What are you reading? Uh, read a lot of science fiction, philosophy, history. Um, I read everything. So I... I probably have about, this is so bad, my, I have like about two storage spaces for my books. Two storage spaces for your books? It's a little bit out of control. Why not a Kindle? I have a Kindle too, I have, you do. I have it all. I heard one of your favorite books is Baltasar Gracian, yeah. the, the Art of Worldly, Worldly Wisdom. Yeah, Why? book. It's just a um, good philosophical book. Uh, he, he was a Jesuit in the Spanish um, court and really understands how power works and so it's okay. a good book. Wow, Crazy. give us another recommendation. Maybe one that's a little more modern and like 
Um, to read. No, by the way, I, I don't want to put down the, the older book. I find that like Sun Tzu, The Art of War, those older books hold up really well. So I, I don't mean to put it down, but I want one that maybe is a little more approachable if you have one. Um, I recommend, like, I'm a big science fiction fan. I think if you really understand where the world is going, uh -huh. like, read science fiction. Don't read this book when you're depressed, um, <laughs> but it's, it's called Wind Up Girl, and it's really dark. Okay. But it's, it's probably one of the best sort of, like, like if you, if you don't believe in, in, in the world of, like, global warming, like, mm -hmm. this book is so good about, it talks about sort of the ramifications of global warming, how this affects society going forward. And also on uh, genetics and biotech, mm -hmm. it's also a lot of it's in here. It's really good. Pomp, what are you doing for fun? Um, nothing, no. So I, I read a lot. Uh, I'm probably a little weird in that, like right now I've got uh, John Paulson's new book uh, on China. Then I've got uh, Scott Kapoor's book on Secrets of Sand Hill. And then book. Uh, Range. Wait, can you say that last, that last one again? It's uh, Secrets of Sand Hill. Secrets of Han Sand Hill Road. Yeah, it, Hill it, Road. It's, yeah, if you actually want to understand how venture capital works and the business models and the yeah. frameworks, I actually think it's probably one of the best books. And Scott's a great guy too, so I recommend it. Okay, sorry, you're saying one, one other one. It, well, and uh, then Range and just Two of them are physical books, which I'm actually don't like as much as the Audible, um, so I can yeah. listen to the audio books. Uh, but I'm a huge believer for investors specifically, but also the, I think for founders, like to like live life. And what you find is there's a lot of investors who are so focused on my job is to invest, and so all I do is I just look at pitch decks all day, and, and they're like you know so granularly focused on their email and inbox here and all this stuff that they miss the broader tr trends. So like I watch tons of movies and YouTube videos and I listen to a bunch of podcasts and I pay attention to things that I see people doing, conversations with friends. If I hear two or three people say that they've gone and done something recently or used something, uh -huh. um, you start to identify this stuff. And so to me, uh, the book Range, actually that's what it's about, is like the whole range. range. It's okay. like the generalist is better suited or positioned for the future than people who are super specific around their knowledge and skill set. Okay. So if you think of, if you have a really, really deep skill set, like a radiologist, a computer actually is pretty good at replacing you, right? We're seeing this now, like, so with machine learning and computer vision, we're actually seeing algorithms and computers replace the radiologist. They can identify stuff on a, uh, like a CAT scan or MRI better. But if you have more of a generalist or creative type uh, skill set, it's much harder for a computer to replace you, and so that's where a lot of the value is going to accrue. Well, newsflash, most of the people in this room, if you are interested in remote work or running a company that way, it's not traditional, right? And so you're more likely to have some of that creative um, skill set than I think other entrepreneurs. Nick, you've raised money, right? I, th I think people should find a way to talk to you too, right, to understand it from your point of view. Eighty, did you? You did. Eighty. Uh, known for WooCommerce. What's the latest company? Convergio, right? Okay. Um, I think that's super helpful. Let's talk about, I think to close it out, what, what are you seeing that's counterintuitive right now that you disagree with what, like the way the, like I'm looking back at your old posts. So interesting. I write every single day and he found stuff from like six, seven years ago. I love because here's what it is. Anyone can write today and maybe be right today or, or who knows. To look back and see you think about Bitcoin before Bitcoin was a thing. To sit back and see you think about being open as an entrepreneur back when, you know, people weren't necessarily. I think that's interesting. I'm curious, what do you see today that's that different that we can now pay attention to? So um, I, I can say this outside the U.S. and not be as unpopular. Uh, I think the U.S. is in a lot of trouble compared to other places in the world because, uh, we were talking about earlier, um, the U.S. has a lot of rules, right? And the rules are sometimes legal rules and sometimes they are uh, more like society rules. Uh, and those rules prevent entrepreneurs from breaking the rules, like right? What? So we'll t I'll give you two uh -huh. examples. So on the legal side, if you look at in crypto specifically, there's a bunch of rules around accreditation, uh. et cetera. So how you actually can raise capital, huge problem in the US compared to other places. You're actually seeing entrepreneurs leave to go to other places to, to raise capital uh, through these mechanisms. Another would be um, something around like DNA sequencing, right? So in the US, uh, it is not very popular to talk about taking DNA from people who maybe aren't voluntarily giving it to you to do research. 
in other countries, that's a normal practice. And okay. so that is a very, very sensitive topic in the U.S., but outside the U.S., there's actually more leeway. There's more uh, opportunity for innovation. And so there's a whole bunch in between, right, of like uh-huh. the legal rules and, and the society rules. But I do think that what you're going to see is more and more founders from outside the U.S. building companies that become these global you yeah. know, goliaths because they're forced to from day one. Right, like, like one framework that I always think about is, uh, so I worked at Facebook for a while, and Facebook started in the US, deeply penetrated the US from a user base standpoint, and then expanded internationally. We saw this with Uber, right, all these companies, Airbnb, et cetera. Yeah. What we're seeing in crypto specifically is they're building a decentralized company from day one, and they're going global first, and then they're coming to the US. So it's almost happening in inverse. Yeah. I think outside of crypto, we're, we're going to start seeing you. I mean, you've spent a ton of time in Asia, so you probably understand even better than I do. Yeah, so so I, I would I would say I agree in general um, with, with a lot of this stuff. I would say I am short-term very bearish on the U.S. Um, for many, many reasons, you know, for Silicon Valley on the U.S. short-term. Long-term, I'm, I'm still very, 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 very bullish. What, what are the reasons why you're bearish on it? I just think with the present administration, I, and this is not a political thing, I yeah. think there's some real, real challenges, particularly if you think about immigration, right? Why the U.S. has been so dominant? Um, we've been very, very open in the past, and we sucked in all the talent, all the brilliant people, and now we've made it. If you look in the last two years, the amount of foreign students have actually gone down a lot in, in the US. I, I gotta interrupt you for a second. So one of my goals is to run a marathon on every continent in one year. Seven continents, seven marathons, one year. And as I travel the world, I'm doing interviews. I just got back from Singapore. I ran 26.2 miles in Mongolia. I flew to Singapore because I heard there were a lot of entrepreneurs there, and then I came here. I sat down with this founder, uh, A.B. Gupta. He's created uh, Circles Life. I don't know if you guys know it, but what it does is it makes the phone service a lot more approachable, like nice app, easy to sign up, easy to cancel, the whole thing. I said, how much money are you making? It's been like five years, just like I asked you. He goes, $150 million, it's just a start. We're thinking bigger, can we buy AT&T one day? I say. <laughs> That's why I love entrepreneurs. <laughs> right? <laughs> like he's literally journaling through, and the fact that he got to $150 million, it means he's not just dream- daydreaming. I go, so what was it like to grow up in Singapore? He goes, I'm not from Singapore, don't you hear my accent? I go, where are you from? He goes, India. I said, what was it like? He goes, you have to understand how poor I was. I said, then how'd you get here? I heard that it's tough with an Indian passport to travel. He said, the Singaporean government had this contest to see which smart kids had potential. He said, I somehow won this contest. They brought me over here, they got me into school, and they made it easy for me to start a company. And I'm thinking, that is like the opposite of what we're seeing, right? They're trying to recruit. And then I I talked to other entrepreneurs, they get to go to Stanford, it's literally like Stanford and a few other schools, funded by the, the Singapore government. Actually, no, they would get scholarships because the Singapore government put them on a fast track. Then Singapore wants to pay them, you, you're nodding, you've seen this, I, I didn't know, blew my mind, to come back to the US. Now, let's talk on a smaller level. I did this in an office where I come in at 8.30 to make sure all the equipment is ready for me to record with them. I see the receptionist there at 8.30. I race at the end of the day to make sure everything's good, and I see the receptionist is still there. I said, well, aren't you supposed to leave? It's 5.30. She says, no. I said, when are you supposed to leave? He goes, 6 o'clock. She's just a receptionist. We're talking about longer hours, more commitment, and all the things that we thought were, we had going for us, like education, like the ability to draw in the best talent, not, not going for us anymore. That shocked me. Yeah, I, I mean, Singapore is so well positioned. It's like, Singapore's not even a country. It's like a, it's like a corporation that owns like a, a, a country, right? But it's run like a corporation. It's run very well. You know what? We can talk about Singapore that way. Very anal people, right? They're here for a mission. Hey, Let me tell so you about positioned. Chile. Chile. How many entrepreneurs did I interview there, including this guy, Lloyd? I go, you're not Chilean. He goes, of course not. I came here for startup Chile. They gave him some money. So he goes, what the hell? Let's go see what, what Chile's like. He fell in love. He's living there now, right? We're talking about environment. I understand it. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I see that there's a pull and I see that there's a competitive uh, pressure and that outside the U.S. is looking really good lately. Canada's looking super good. They're so well positioned. Like, I mean, they want to bring in a million new immigrants in the next, like, two years, like, qualified immigrants. Okay. And so that's the, that's the arms war. I think China is actually, the, the view of China, I think, is very negative. And, and this is the trade war, whatever. I think they're not very well positioned for the future. Because? Just because of demographic issues. They have massive financial issues that they've buried. And so this idea of just, like, maybe it's very Thelian, of just, like, if the media is writing about China being dominant, they're probably wrong. 
We should, by the way, we should bring up the questions and give me, give me like the high signal whenever you guys are five minutes before the end. The, the other thing I'll say is um, another framework that investors are very fond of is technology and what end up being companies starts on the fringe, right? So uh, the fringe can mean a whole lot of things. A lot of times you'll see this with criminals first, right? So if you think of everything from beepers that the drug dealer on the uh, corner had, that it tattoos, creates, tattoos, right? Bitcoin, all this kind of stuff. Um, but the other thing too is- uh, Wait, you're saying study the criminals. Well, what are they using? That's one, so if you okay. think of fringe, uh -huh. right? Think of it, uh, you have the nucleus of society, which is yeah. like, the middle class, American family, whatever, they're usually the last people to use whatever piece of technology, so Facebook. Like the 45 year old in America was the last to use it in America compared to whether it's young people, whether it's criminal activity. Yeah. Remote work is actually, um, people who are engaged in that type of company building is one of the quote unquote fringes, ah, okay. right? And so many of the things that people in this room are doing today will become the norm over time, right? So somebody who's had a remote work company for two, three, four, five years, they figured things out that eventually the Facebooks and Googles will do. Got it. But it starts at the fringe and it eventually gets adopted. I think also in countries is another fringe, right? So yeah. if you're looking at Silicon Valley as the heart of venture capital, actually the things that people are doing in Chile, Singapore, China, wherever, they're being forced to be uh, innovative because it's out of necessity, yeah. right? The founder in San Francisco who can raise a couple million dollars and you know spend $50,000 a month on rent has a much different need than the entrepreneur who's somewhere else who says, look, the only way I can build this company is if I do X, Y, or Z. I was in uh, Mexico City, again, running a marathon, and there's this founder, he tried to sell online. He realized people wanted to buy, but they didn't have credit cards. A big part of the world doesn't have credit cards because I gotta solve that because I can't sell anything online. Turns out now, if you go to grocery stores in Mexico City, there's a place where you can give the dude cash behind the counter, he then registers you as, as having given money and you could then use that to buy stuff online, right? Or you buy something online and then they give you a number, you take it to a grocery store, they punch it in their computer, you give them cash, they punch that in the computer, you get it, it's unbelievable. Let's take a look at the questions.